you. Not too bad, not too bad. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. Welcome, Latoya. So I've got three o'clock now. My name is Sarah Rabier. Like I said, I'm one of the math instructors here at the college. So I'm going to um, give you guys a short demo of what it would be like if you guys took a math class with me. Um, feel free to use the chat feature. The and you guys are welcome to talk on your microphones. The only question that I ask is that, you know, when we talk on the microphones, um, I'm gonna ask that one of us talk at a time just because when a whole bunch of us talk at the same time, I won't be able to answer your questions or even hear your questions. So, and that'll just make life easier on all of us. Okay, excellent. So normally when I teach a classroom, what I do is I go through my agenda in the morning, the first thing I do. And so for those of you guys who are new to the college, make sure you register your, for, your, for your classes as soon as possible. So that way you have access, you know, to desire to learn. Desire to learn is a feature where I'm going to post and I'm going to share that feature with you guys right now. I'll have the link to our class available. Okay, so that way you guys can register for your class just like you did now. I don't require a password. Uh, it's just, I think it just makes life easier for just to, to click on a button, register, and then once you're in the waiting room, I'll let you guys in. And so you're going to register and please use the name, you know, that you have when you first signed up for the college. Okay. Now, you know, this is what I have available for next semester. And so I have my upcoming assignments on the news items. And so you're going to want to pay attention to this closely and carefully so you don't miss assignments. And I've got the due dates provided. And on the left hand side, I have notes as well. So please take advantage, you know, of, please make sure you guys sign up for your classes as soon as possible. Make sure you guys check desire to learn in your emails at least once a day in case there's any new changes or updates from me or the college. Um, financial aid also sends information using your email, same with records. So you're gonna wanna make sure you sign up and you're on top of things, okay? So let's begin with our lecture for today. And if you guys have questions, just stop and pause me, okay? Or send me a message on the chat feature. Um, I'm gonna be flexible either way. And so let's begin. Let's see. So the first thing, okay. So I've got a couple of options when it comes to like presenting the information. And okay, excellent. So I'm going to give you guys a brief little lecture about probabilities. Out of curiosity, does anyone play poker in here? Or have a friend that plays poker? No. No? <laughs> what about lottery tickets? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. We're going to come back and talk about those lottery tickets in a little bit. But let's talk about probability. This is a real good topic that I like to relate, to relate to lottery tickets. So what is a probability? A probability is an event that something is likely to happen. And so it's embedded in later statistical concepts like hypothesis testing. And we use hypothesis testing for decision-making processes. So let's go down. There are a couple of probability rules that we need to know really well. Let me make that a little bit bigger. There we go. That looks better. So, for example, probability values are numbers ex expressed from zero to one. All right. Zero means that the probability is not likely to occur. One means that our probability is going to occur. And it's okay to have values in between zero and one. So let's draw like a little number line. So this is a digital whiteboard that I use to write on and present my notes. Give me one second. Just hold on. Okay, there we go. And drawing a line on this thing is not the easiest thing to do. So hold on one second. Okay, there we go. All right, so when you flip a coin, what's the probability of getting a tail? Go ahead, Brad. 
50. Yeah, 50 percent. And you can have probability values right in the middle. Now let's go back to those lottery tickets. For those of you guys who have a friend that plays a lottery, how many of your friends have actually won the jackpot? None. None. Yes. So you can't express the probability value as zero. The probability of winning that jackpot is very, very slim. It's like one out of a million. So if a probability is impossible, then we're going to say the probability of that event is zero, or you can even give it like an extremely small decimal value. One means that the probability is most likely to occur. What's the probability that it's going to be really hot in South Carolina today? It is hot. Yeah, it is hot. So it's going to be a one, definitely. And so we can re represent those probability values as fractions or decimals. So let's scroll down a little bit. Um, my classes are more interactive. I am going to have you guys answer questions. And you guys are welcome to use the chat feature to answer those questions in case you don't feel comfortable speaking out loud, OK? So let's go down. Definitions in math are very important. And so I do make an emphasis on using those definitions. So when we talk about an event, it's a collection of results or outcomes of a procedure. You can have multiple events, or you can have simple events that can't be broken down any further. So like flipping a head or a tail when you're flipping that coin. And let's talk about the interpretation of probabilities. If our probability value is 0 0.05 or less, we're going to say that probability is unlikely to occur. So let's talk about the sample space of a probability value. And when we talk about sample spaces, we want to talk about all the possible outcomes. So if I'm rolling a dice, what are all my possible outcomes? One, two, six. Yeah, one through six. Very good. So I'm just going to write out all those possible outcomes. If I'm flipping a coin, what are all my possible outcomes? Two. Heads or tails. Good. Heads or tails. Very good. Heads or tails. What if I'm flipping two coins? Now, this is different. So let's talk about that first flip. So we talked before that in the first flip, we had a head or a tail. What about the second flip? Head or a tail. Yeah, same thing, head or tail. So this is called a tree diagram that I'm making. And so all of my possible outcomes are going to be a head, head. And let's highlight that for a second. Head, head. The second outcome will be head, tail. Who can tell me what's my third outcome going to be? If I'm going in that pattern. Tail head. Good. Tail head. And then what's the last one? Tail tail. Tail tail. tail. Awesome. So that's the probability of flipping two coins. Now let's take it up a notch. So I'm going to discuss two different techniques to finding the probability. <laughs> The first technique is called the relative frequency approach. And so I have a definition and a formula provided. If you look at that formula, you're going to have to find the probability of a specific event. You're going to want to see the number of times that specific event occurred divided by the number of times the procedure was repeated. So let's look at an example together. So a recent Harris Interactive survey of 1,010 adults in the U.S. showed that 202 of them smoke. Find the probability that a randomly selected adult in the U.S. is a smoker. When you're reading these word problems, read them for meaning. See what information is given, okay? Word problems are our best friends. So look at that word problem for a second. What should I underline or highlight? 
110 and 202. Good. 1,010 adults. And, and get those numbers meaning, we know 202 of them smoke. So if I want to find the probability that someone is a smoker, what's that probability going to be? 202 over... Sorry. This right, 202 over 1010. Good job. Yeah, we're going to use that formula. The number of times that event occurred, the number of times that people smoke, divided by the total, 1010. And so we're going to want to reduce that to lowest, firm, to lowest terms. So let's see, I've got a question. Okay, awesome. So let me hold on. Let me pull up the calculator for just a second. There we go. Okay. Okay, so if you're taking a statistics class, so you'll need a calculator. And so we're gonna reduce that to lowest terms and we can represent our probabilities as decimals. All right, let's look at that table for a second. And I'm gonna have you guys try the table on your own for about a minute or two. And this is example three. So try example three on your own and go ahead, message me an answer once you guys get it. Okay, I've got one person who's messaged me an answer. So someone asked me a question about the virtual calculator. I think um, TI-84 is providing free downloads of the calculator and you have the option of purchasing one. I've got one answer for example three. What about the rest of you all? Okay, two answers, awesome. Can I have a third person answer? Okay, let's go over this. Let's go over this. So we have, we want to find the probability that someone carpools to work. Okay, that's my event, carpools to work. And so we're going to put the total in the denominator. And I have 22 people in our survey who said that they carpool to work. And so we got to reduce that to lowest terms. And I get 0.11. Good job, team. Very good. So let's scroll down further. Now, we want to determine if this event is unusual. How do I know if something is unusual? You guys tell me. Who remembers? Closer to zero. Closer to zero, but I had a specific answer. So there's a cutoff point. A 0.5 or less. Awesome. It's got to be 0.5 or less. So this doesn't fall within our cutoff point. So this is not considered to be an unusual event. All right. Good job. So the second probability technique is the classical approach. So you've got, you can use either the definition or the formula to help you guys with this. So you're going to be given a procedure and it has a certain number of simple events. And each of those specific events has an equal chance of occurring. So you want to find the number of ways, you know, those events occur and divide it by the total. So in the classical approach, each event is equally likely to occur. But in the relative frequency approach, the events are not equally likely to occur. Let's look at example four together. So Sophia has three tickets to a concert. Sam, Mike, Tina, and May have all stated they would like to go to the concert with Sophia. 
To be fair, Sophia decides to randomly select the two people who can go to the concert with her. So let's look at A, let's determine the sample space of the experiment, <clears throat> excuse me. So we wanna find out all the possible ways two people can attend that concert with her. So what's one way or what's one option that we have? You guys tell me. Sam and Mike. Okay, you said Sam and Mike, I like that. Sam and Mike. What's another option? Tina and May. Tina and May, good. Okay. Sam and Tina. Sam and Tina, good. Tina and Mike. Yeah. Good, Tina and Mike. May and Tina. May and Tina, good. Is that it, or do we have any more? Sam and May. Yeah, Sam and Mike. Sam and May. Mm -hmm. Okay. We we have Sam and Mike already, but I think is that it? No. Sam. Yeah, we have Sam and Mike here. Mm -hmm. Sam and May. Sam, Sam and May. Oh, okay. Hold on. Oh, Mike's twice. So Sam and May. Okay, so I think we have all of it. So now we want to compute the probability that Mike and Sam attend the concert. So what is the probability that Sam and Mike attend the concert? Two over six? Yeah. Oh, hold on, I meant to say Sam and Mike. Well, it's got to be exactly Sam and Mike. One over six. Yeah, one over six. There you go. Awesome. Now we've got to compute the probability that May attends the concert. So what is the probability that May attends the concert? Two of six. Okay. No. So pay close, so pay close attention, so. Three over six. Three yeah. over six, awesome, Stephanie. Three over six, and that's gonna reduce to one half, or 50%. Where's the third May? Got it. Oh, yeah. 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 My bad. <laughs> <laughs> But awesome job. And so this does build up to later statistical concepts. So we'll be looking at p-values at the end. Um, and then in later classes, you'll talk about the addition rule of probability and the multiplication rule. So that's it with the lecture. Do you guys have any questions or concerns for me? Good job team, by the way, very awesome. Are all the classes virtual? Um, there are going to be some classes that are face-to-face, -face, and then there's going to be some online um, where you wouldn't have the teacher interaction, except via email. Oh, sorry, Stephanie? Can you explain the difference with those virtual yes. and online? Yeah, so the online classes, you'll mostly have videos to watch. Um, some of it will be like, how do I describe it? And then you'll have homework as well. And I think with the instructors that teach that, I don't teach the online classes. I, I've been doing virtual strictly this semester. You, they'll probably have like a set day where you can take your test, but you're gonna have to wait and talk to them. Um, so and then, so, oh, go ahead. So it's online, it's virtual and in person, all three, is it? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, so this is what a virtual class would look like. Um, in case you decide to take one. I got a um, 
question. Um, someone messaged me when you're talking when you were talking registering early. Is that for each individual class? So I meant for students who haven't registered in classes in general. Um, if you have not registered, make sure you guys register as soon as possible. My classes are filling up quickly, um, and you're going to want to grab the spots that you want that fit with your schedule as soon as possible. Just because some of these classes are just they're filling up pretty quickly. What about the rest of you guys? Okay, so this is a really good question. What are some resources available to help students learn? So we've got a bunch of resources available at the college. For example, the college is offering tutor.com and that's a wonderful resource available for you guys. You're gonna wanna use that resource to help you, you know, in case you get, get stumped or stuck on something, there are my office hours or your other teachers will also have office hours as well to answer any questions. I also love YouTube as a resource and let's go to YouTube for just a second. Um, so I'm going to pull up YouTube right now. And I'm also going to pull up Pearson. In the math department, we like to use Pearson um, when we're doing our homework when we're assigning homework to you guys. So most of your, your, of your math teachers are gonna use Pearson or My Math Lab to present your homework. So like for example, Math 120 BO2. Actually, let me use a different, um, let me go to Math 110 instead. So this is for the upcoming semester and I'm, wanted to use this because I don't have any names or grades announced and I prefer to keep your classmates information confidential. But let's see, that's not what I wanted. Okay, chapter content. There we go. Yeah. So my math lab will have an e textbook available for you guys. Okay, um, solutions to problems in case you guys need help. And you know, it also teaches you how to get the most out of my math lab and also resources for success. So you're going to want to use all the features that are available on my math lab to really help you learn the material as much as possible. And then let me go ahead. Um, so it's taking its time to load. That's okay. Yeah, there we go. There we go. So resources for success. And there are some built-in videos on how to, on some of the topics. So in case you didn't feel comfortable with my explanation, you know, you do have a video available via Pearson to help you out with the material, with this information. And I love using YouTube um, as a way of learning math. So like, for example, with today's lesson, we talked about probability. In the math department, we have certain videos that we love introducing students to. Um, for example, Khan Academy is a classic. And we have Patrick JMT, who's also another favorite in the math department. Yeah, there we go. So he has really amazing YouTube videos that, and he does a really great job breaking that down the information to help students. Let me go ahead and I've got two, a couple of other questions. Okay, let's see. So I've got, this is a really good question. What would you say to people who might be apprehensive about, about learning math in a virtual environment versus face-to-face? -face? So, Let me think about that one. That's a good question. What would you say to people who might be apprehensive about learning math in a virtual environment versus face-to-face? -face? Um, I would say, you know, it, it is a scary time. Um, it is a really scary time at this moment, but you know, we're all in this together. Um, we're going to get through this and, you know, think of it this way, you know, life is always going to throw some sort of challenge. Um, and so this pandemic is a life challenge. But you know, the cool thing is Midlands Tech, I've always thought, I actually used to be a former student at Midlands Tech, and I've always found the instructors to be really helpful. Um, 
And so you're more than welcome, you know, in case you have questions or concerns, don't feel embarrassed about asking us those questions or concerns because we've also encountered challenges in our lives that we had to overcome. And if we can be successful, so can you guys. Don't feel embarrassed, you know. You, we are, there are a lot of employees at the college who are safe people to talk to, whether it's me or another wonderful employee at the college. There is always a resource available. So, you know, if you feel nervous, that's normal. Everybody feels nervous. I actually felt nervous, you know, when I first started college as a face-to-face -face student. Now we just have a pandemic. Um, so I would say, you know, it's normal to feel a little bit nervous and you're not going to be the only one who feels that way. There'll be a lot of people. All right, so how do you handle students with technical difficulties? So give me one second. Technical difficulty. So if you have a technical difficulty, I would say communicate with your instructor as soon as possible, okay? Um, and I would also say be flexible, you know, and you're, as you're, for me as an instructor, I'm going to be flexible with students when it comes to technical difficulties, just because they can happen anytime. This semester, and I'm actually, it's interesting that I was asked this question. One of my assignments for my students is, and let's go to that assignment. I'm going to have my students complete a technology action plan. And so, and I myself and I'm going to have a technology action plan that I'm brainstorming. Um, and so, you know, you want, guys, want, in fact, you might want to take a picture of this. Um, I think this is actually useful, not only for my class, but other people's classes. So you want to think about how you're going to stay focused during a virtual class. All right. That helps to answer those questions. Um, I will have a lot of us in the math department will have our videos available online in case you guys need them. Um, and there will be other resources as well. I'll also have my notes as well in class. So these notes will also be posted for students. And then some of us will be using the notes from Pearson and Pearson actually has the question, explanation and solution provided. Uh, okay. Um, you might want to think about challenges that you're going to encounter during a virtual class. So if you lose power or internet, it's going to happen to all of us. Um, so like I said, there is a backup plan in case you do lose that. And then you want to think about those backup resources. Okay. If you lose internet connections, you also want to think about how you're going to complete those assignments. So my biggest advice is to complete your assignment as soon as possible. Okay. Complete it as soon as possible. Um, and you do need to have a way of getting access to my math lab. And so, and if you have issues with getting my math lab, I would say talk to your teacher as soon as possible and maybe we can try to connect you to a resource with the college. Someone also mentioned, thank you, Shell, for mentioning this. Um, for resources available at the college, we have the Academic S Success Center for tutoring. And then we have the Life Skills Center for communication, time management, and test anxiety. So yeah, t take advantage of all the resources available. And I spoke with Eva O'Brien earlier today. The Sunshine Closet is also available for students in case you do need access to food. Okay. Are there any additional questions? Anything else or any comments? Thank you, Stephanie. All right, well, thank you guys um, for a wonderful class. Um, in case you do have questions or if you want to even chat with me privately, you're more than welcome to stick around, so. So do we need to use a webcam? So someone just asked me, do we need to use a webcam? Um, I'm gonna say wait till the first day of class, okay? 
for me, I'm going to be doing proctor tests this semester, and so you're going to need some sort of camera so I can monitor you guys when you're taking a test, okay? Um, there are certain math classes that occur in a sequence, and you do need to have an understanding of those of the material in order to be successful in the next math class. That was a really good question. What, and you can actually, some of us are actually allowing students to download cameras on their phones. Um, there are some apps available that let you use that. What about the rest of you all? You have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, real quick, how do you structure beyond the, the lecture part? How do you structure the rest of your class period? Do you have them all come back at the end? Do you have like some time for them to go off and practice on their own or what does that look like? Yeah, I do have, um, I give students the time to practice on their own. Um, and sometimes we'll have like more than one lesson in a class period. Um, in the fall, I'm going to be doing something new. I'm going to be using the breakout feature. So that way students can interact with one another um, and get that social aspect that they may be missing in college. So I'm going to try to do a variety of things to get the students engaged. Um, sometimes we might have little competitions using the chat feature with one another um, when it comes to answering questions and there will be bonus opportunities. Okay. Very good. That's the biggest is trying to figure out how to structure what would normally be a, a 90 minute class period or something like that. Yeah. So how long does your lecture usually last? Um, I normally, let's see, well, let's say we've got like 90 minutes for a class lecture. I may lecture anywhere between 40 to 45 minutes, and then I'll try to give um, time for students to practice the concepts, and then we'll have discussions together about those concepts to see if they're in the right directions or if they need more practice. Okay. Yeah. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.